So thanks very much. So um, yeah, is this okay? Right here. Um, so I was asked to give just a just an overview about uh, diabetes after transplant, and and uh, most of you, I'm sure, have dealt with this or seen it or have patients who have it, and you've struggled with it just like I have. So um, I, I I'm I'm going to do the best I can, and and hopefully it'll give you some sort of idea about the way I think about islet transplant. I do have some disclosures, but this is nothing to do really with this at all. Um, so the objectives today are to define post-transplant diabetes mellitus, which is the way we term this now. We used to call it NODAT or new onset diabetes after transplant. We no longer call it that. We basically call it post-transplant diabetes. And, and talk about a little bit about the incidence and the diagnosis and then review some of the risk factors um, and the pathophysiology behind it and understand the approach to management. Um, so, right, so the incidence is quite variable. I mean, if you look at studies, it's all over the map, anywhere from 2% to 50%, depending on which study you look at. So obviously there's huge differences in transplant populations, the type of transplant, the medications used, other factors involved. And so, um, but obviously this, this is a, a pretty high incidence, and I would argue that that 2% probably underestimates it, maybe the 50% overestimates it, but not by much. So if I were to look at my own clinic or the, the transplant clinic at BGH, I would say that we're probably looking at at least 30 to 40%, um, which would be a reasonable estimate. Um, the diagnostic criteria have not been well defined in the past, and, and we generally use the same diagnostic criteria that are used for anyone with type 2 diabetes or any diabetes. That is a random glucose over 11.1, fasting glucose greater than 7, A1C greater than or equal to 6.5, um, or, and some people have defined it as any need for insulin after transplant. Um, now, this is the need for insulin, of course, is not a a formal diagnostic criteria, but generally we say that the diagnostic criteria are similar to the normal diagnostic criteria for diabetes. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about screening and sort of how we approach that. So for patients on steroids especially, uh, screening and testing uh, for uh, hyperglycemia is, is incredibly important because that, among all of the risk factors, the use of steroids is perhaps the greatest risk factor other than, other than maybe a uh, history of prediabetes. Um, so, you know, there are a variety of contributors to post-transplant diabetes and, and of course steroids is one major contributor, but also things that contribute to either insulin resistance, which is one of the hallmarks of type two diabetes or beta cell deficiency, a loss of beta cell function. And you can see that some of the medications that are non-steroid medications have some impact on islet cells or beta cell function. So that would be the, mostly the calcineurin inhibitors, that is tacrolimus and cyclosporin, but also sirolimus may have an effect on beta cell secretion. So insulin levels drop. And then of course, there's things like family history of diabetes, weight gain, which promote insulin resistance, um, an increase in liver transplant patients, an increase in gluconeogenesis, which tends to promote hyperglycemia, increased hepatic glucose output, and also this concept of increased renal clearance of insulin. So, uh, you know, it's a, I, I tell my patients sometimes that it's a bit of a cruel irony that when their kidneys fail, their diabetes gets much, much better. And it, it becomes so easy to manage your diabetes when people are on dialysis or they're in end-stage renal failure because the insulin that their body produces lasts so much longer and is around for so much more than when, they're, when their kidneys were functioning. And the unfortunate part of that is that when they get their transplant, everything turns around. It's sort of like a flip 180. Uh, they're, uh, all of a sudden, they're, the insulin that their pancreas produces is not close to enough. The, the kidney is working and it tends to clear out that insulin. And also they have the stress of the surgery and believe it or not, the kidney is a source of glucose. It's a minor source, but it's a source of glucose, about 5% of total uh, endogenous, uh, endogenous glucose production. Um, and then of course you couple that with the medications and everything else. And it's no wonder that many of these people who had great blood sugars prior to their transplant, all of a sudden have terrible blood sugars. And, and one of the things that I think is one of my hurdles, the hurdles that we have to overcome in patients is kind of forgetting what they did before. You've got to think of it, this is a new start, everything's new. Unfortunately, what you did before is really not likely to work. Uh, it's, it's maybe 5% of people I see in whom what they did before generally will work after their transplant. So we need to get that message across that what they did before is no longer really uh, going to work now. 
So it's that combination, insulin resistance and beta cell deficiency. So in terms of the immunosuppressive medication, I already mentioned steroids. That is by far the greatest contributor to hyperglycemia. But of course, the calcineurin inhibitors do contribute mostly to chromos. That's the sort of the number one. Many of the other ones are considered to be either mildly hyperglycemic or perhaps neutral. Um, mycophenolate, for instance, azathioprine, all of, the, all of these medications tend to not have a great impact on, uh, on blood glucose after transplant. So it's mostly the steroids and the, the tocolomus that are the uh, contributing factors. So how does this affect glucose metabolism? Well, steroids have a number of effects, and many people think about the hepatic effects of, of glucocorticoids. And it is true. It will increase uh, hepatic glucose output by increasing gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. And it has a permissive effect on the effect of glucagon and epinephrine. So these are called counter-regulatory hormones. They tend to promote higher blood sugars. And so all of this is, are effects of steroids. But more than that, the greatest effect is this <laughs> profound insulin resistance that people develop in their peripheral tissues, and that is muscle and fat by and large. So uh, I usually tell people it's like closing the gates, right? So you can imagine that the sugar that your liver produces or that the new kidney produces and the sugar that you take in by mouth, not just sugar, but any carbohydrate, um, is gonna, gonna, tr gonna fill up the bucket, right? So you're gonna fill up all that sugar in your blood, and then the sugar's gotta get somewhere to go. And usually it will go into tissues. It will go into muscle and fat tissues um, and be metabolized. Um, but in order to be taken up into that, the gates have to be opened. It, there has to be an open door for the glucose to go into these tissues. And, and what steroids do is that they block the door, right? They block the door so the sugar has nowhere to go. It circulates around in the, blo in the, in the blood and it starts causing damage. And that's what we don't want. So somehow we need to open up those doors. And there's a couple of ways that we do it. Um, and we'll get to that in a second. But it's, it's really that, the, the closed door effect. So uh, it also has some effects. By the way, steroids have an effect on lipolysis. So you can have dyslipidemia as well. Many of you know, uh, cholesterol, fatty acids, triglycerides, things tend to be elevated when you're on steroids, especially triglycerides. But this is the biggest one, that skeletal muscle insulin resistance. So just to reiterate that, there are a variety of, uh, of areas in the body, muscle, fat, and liver, that, that insulin resistance occurs. All of it tends to promote hyperglycemia. So as a result of that insulin resistance, we get a very, very classic kind of glucose pattern in people with transplants. And that is mostly a insulin resistant pattern. And that manifests as mostly postprandial hyperglycemia. So they wake up, the sugar's good, uh, but they start eating and the sugar goes up. And of course it goes up after breakfast and then it'll go up even higher after lunch. And then as the prednisone effect starts to wear off, the sugar will start to decline, but it usually is well into the evening before you start to see a decline in blood sugar. So you have this kind of, this kind of 12 to 16 hour effect of the prednisone over time. And it happens to be mostly in the middle of the day. So I tell people that the red zone, what I call the red zone is between about 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. where the sugars tend to be the highest. And that's mostly because of this insulin resistance. So if this were purely hepatic glucose output, you can imagine that they would be hyperglycemic no matter what, if they ate or didn't ate, eat. But if you notice when people don't eat, their sugars don't rise that much. Right? Even though they're taking prednisone, their sugars may go up a little bit, but they don't rise dramatically like they do if they're eating. So that's, that uh, rise after eating and the fact that it stays high suggests that it's, it's uh, insulin resistance that's causing that. Now, you can see that this is a study illustrating this uh, pattern. And the most sensitive time to test for, um, for steroid-induced uh, hyperglycemia is after lunch. And it just so happens that prednisone has that effect mostly in the middle of the day. So you're gonna have that, the greatest effect after lunchtime. And that is illustrated right here. You can see that that two hour post-lunch sugar is going to be the most sensitive for picking up um, steroid or post-transplant uh, diabetes. So if you're looking for post-transplant diabetes in the morning glucose, you're not gonna find it, right? I mean, this is American units, but um, this is you know, roughly under six right here and you're just not gonna find it if you just check the morning sugar. So if you're looking for steroid-induced diabetes, don't just check the morning sugar, check it at other times of day, particularly after lunch.
And this illustrates, they actually did some testing. They looked at different times of day, they tested, uh, and they found that the greatest sensitivity was this two hour post lunch um, testing. We know that hyperglycemia tends to uh, increase hospital stays. So people who have diabetes after transplant, they tend to stay in hospital longer. This happens to be after bone marrow transplant, but there are similar data for solid organ transplant. And there are a number of potential consequences, possible uh, consequences like reduced graft function and survival, variety of mechanisms. There's reduced pa potential for re reduced patient survival and also for other cardiovascular disease, as you would see in anyone with type 2 diabetes. And that's particularly true of people with uh, diabetic nephropathy, which is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Uh, some evidence suggests that it is associated with graft loss, an increased risk of graft loss. So this was a comparison, retrospective comparison of patients who lost graft function and that looked at that, compared it to their degree of hyperglycemia. And you can see that other than fasting, impaired fasting glucose, this is people with normal glucose tolerance, impaired glucose tolerance, and post transplant diabetes. And there, was, there did seem to be a difference in the number of people who, uh, who had these who lost graft function. So that suggests that it does have an impact on graft function. And you can imagine that that would be the case. So what about risk factors? Well, there are a variety of risk factors. We sometimes think of them as modifiable risk factors and non-modifiable risk factors. Among the non-modifiable risk factors, of course, are things like age, uh, ethnicity, uh, male gender, family history, certain HLA types, um, mismatch, donor mismatch, uh, acute rejection, of course, deceased donor transplant, uh, and um, polycystic kidneys. And then the modifiable uh, ones would be choice of immunosuppression, of course, use of corticosteroids or glucocorticoids, and any other modifiable risk factor like um, obesity and exercise and diet, all of the ones that we typically think of. And then there are a couple that uh, have come up uh, in these studies that are potentially modifiable, I guess. Uh, the um, ACV and CMV infections uh, uh, appear to be associated with a higher incidence of, uh, of post-transplant post diabetes. And also um, the, the pre-transplant impaired uh, glucose tolerance uh, is a risk factor that uh, if identified early, uh, potentially could be modified prior to their transplant. So when we think about identifying patients who are at risk for post-transplant diabetes, um, there's a whole sort of bunch of things that can be done. And in particular, when they're being assessed for transplant, you, you know, it's possible to identify some of these risk factors ahead of time and maybe institute some kind of screening. Now, I, I can't really speak for the pre-transplant side of it, but certainly, um, certainly if you can identify these patients earlier, then you may be able to, to determine who will need uh, more uh, intervention after their transplant. Um, and of course, you, you, know, you do your history and physical, et cetera. You want to look at their blood sugars. And they're recommending if their blood sugar is uh, above uh, 6.1, which is not diabetic range, but it is in the impaired range, that you test every three years. And if it's, um, I guess, with the fasting glucose between 6.1 and 7, if it's less than 6.1, it's every three years. And if it's over, you do annual testing. And then, of course, you, do, you look at all of these different risk factors that we discussed before, these modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. Among the, the, the highest that I usually think of uh, are uh, family history. So if they have a family history of type 2 diabetes, particularly a first-degree family member, then their risk is going to be substantially higher of developing post-transplant diabetes, and, and uh, even if they've never had diabetes themselves. And you can imagine that the way I think of it is that their pancreas, they have some in, inherent defects, probably genetically related, some inherent defects in the pancreas' ability to produce sugar but, uh, or to produce insulin. But as long as they're not stressed, as long as they're not taking medication or getting a transplant or doing something else that puts a lot of stress in their pancreas, maybe their blood sugars are normal. But the minute they undergo that stress, uh, that transplant with the medication, that's what tips them over into this diabetic range, okay? And the family history is a good indication of what, it's, what their underlying pancreas function is likely to be. So asking about family history, I think, is very helpful in the situation. So when you think about screening, uh, basically you're looking at screening and counseling people who may have a risk for post-transplant diabetes. You want to consider uh, after transplant, of course, people are at high risk. You want to monitor them, so weekly for the first few weeks and then every three months and every six months and then annually. And then, of course, for people who do develop diabetes, you want to look at the other risk factors, 
like lipids, and you want to follow A1C, as, uh, of course, and diabetes complications. And we're going to talk a little bit about management as well. So first of all, we all talk about dietary modification, or at least I do. Uh, that's probably what I spend 80% of my time talking about. It's not insulin. It's not medication. It's what people are eating. Uh, so for those of you who are nutritionists or uh, have these conversations, you, can, you know that it's really a struggle to, to dig out what people are actually eating because they don't like to admit it. And, and sometimes you have to really dig, but uh, it's very, very helpful if you can identify when people are having uh, simple carbohydrates. A lot of people think, of course, that fruit is healthy and it is healthy generally, but for people with diabetes, fruit is a, is a you know, it's, 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 not a, it's not forbidden, but it's, you gotta be really, really careful. And of course, people eat fruit like it's, you know, not gonna be around tomorrow. So, um, so that, you know, you gotta be careful about these things, more fiber, a little less uh, uh, simple carbohydrates. Uh, exercise, of course, makes a big difference. And I, and I didn't talk about exercise before, but remember I told you about the gates being closed, uh, not allowing the glucose to, to go into tissue. Well, one way to open those gates is by exercise. And so, you know, we think about insulin as opening the gates. That's certainly one way to open the gate to allow glucose to go into tissues. But the other way to open it is through exercise. So if people are regularly walking or doing some kind of moderate physical activity, they don't have to do anything intense, but they have to do it for long enough that it's going to make a difference. And I usually tell people it's got to be at least 30 to 40 minutes uh, in order to see a difference in blood sugars, right? And it's got to be something moderately active. They can't just be strolling along right? They've got to be doing something a little bit more than that, but they don't have to be doing anything really intense. So that's another way to open up the, uh, open up the gates. And of course, you want to talk about weight and smoking cessation as well. Um, risk, uh, immunosuppressive modification, uh, modification I, I don't generally deal with this part of it. I leave that up to the transplant physicians, but of course, that could be something else that be, could be considered if it was a concern. And then, of course, pharmacologic therapy. And this is where I deal with mostly. So, you know, when we think about uh, treating hyperglycemia, um, many people would like to be able to just go on pills or they were on pills before their transplant. They want to be able to stay on pills. Um, you know, the, the problem with that is that the effect of steroids in particular is, is so strong. It's so profound that it's really hard for oral medication to overcome that degree of insulin resistance. And that's why medication by and large, except for people who only have very mild hyperglycemia, that's why oral medication is really not as effective generally. And, and frankly, for most people is not an ideal way of treating post-transplant diabetes. Now I have a few people, it's probably maybe 15 or 20% of people that can be managed with medication. And that includes sulfonylureas, which tend to increase endogenous insulin or the megalitonides, which is a short-acting secretagogue. You take it before meals, just for that three or four hour period. And then the DPP-4 inhibitors, which are you know, the, the six, uh, citagliptin, saxagliptin kind of thing. Um, those ones have been shown to actually improve glucose after transplant. But again, it, I wouldn't recommend it unless the, the hyperglycemia is relatively mild. And in that case, absolutely, uh, go for it. And, and we haven't mentioned metformin here, but I do, I do use metformin in, in, my, uh, in the post-transplant patients as long as their renal function is reasonable and their GFR is um, reasonably normal. One can argue about what a decent GFR is to use metformin, but um, I think for most post-transplant patients, it's, it's reasonable to use metformin as well. So, but most, unfortunately, for people who are really hyperglycemic, most people end up on insulin. And that's because insulin uh, really is the most effective and completely modifiable. You can do whatever you want to with it, essentially. Um, and, and it really does help control the blood sugar the best, I think, of all of the different therapies. So this is an illustration, again, of this kind of postprandial hyperglycemia, daytime hyperglycemia. Um, and of course, NPH is one of the classic ways to deal with this, mostly because the profile of NPH is roughly similar to the profile of steroid-induced diabetes over that 12 to 16 hour period, and that's why we tend to use it. So NPH, of course, is so-called intermediate acting insulin. It doesn't kick in right away. It takes a few hours to work. And you can see that, roughly speaking, you have a similar profile to the glucose profile. So we generally use NPH as a first choice for most people who have post-transplant diabetes. But there's no reason you couldn't use other ways of dealing with it. So we know that if it's postprandial hyperglycemia that's the problem, why not use prandial insulin 
as a way of treating it. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And in fact, it's more flexible than NPH. So if you really, really wanted to get their sugars under great control, you can say, look, I want you to take insulin before every meal, but I want you to take this much at breakfast and this much at lunch and this much at supper. And you have to adjust the doses according to their needs, right? And of course, that's perfectly fine. You can do that. The problem is that they'd have to be taking injections two or three times a day. And a lot of people don't want to do that. And I think that's perfectly reasonable. So I would say better to try NPH first and if it doesn't work, then you can start adding mealtime insulin. And that's generally my approach. Very practical, nothing magical about it, but uh, I generally do that rather than starting them out on some kind of prandial insulin. Now, the one thing I do not like and would, have, would sort of not use, uh, would not recommend using anyway, um, is the long-acting analogs. So that would be things like Levomir and Lantus and things like that. Now, a lot of people use those out in the community because they're very easy, right? They're very long-acting. They're very lo less likely to cause hypoglycemia. The, but the problem in the transplant setting is you've got this big diurnal variation. So you've got blood sugars that are high during the day and low at night. As you remember, the prednisone kind of wears off. They're not eating at night, so their blood sugar tends to come down overnight. They wake up with a good sugar, and then it starts all over again. So you can imagine that if you started somebody on Lantus in the morning, and you started pushing up the dose enough to get their blood sugars down during the day, what would happen to their nighttime sugars? They go low. So they crash, right? So that's why the long duration of Lantus actually works against the patient in this setting. It's, it's helpful if people don't have transplants and they don't have this big diurnal variation, but it's not helpful if they have a transplant and their, their sugars during the day are high, but their morning sugars are good. So all you're going to do when you use Lantus in this case is probably cause nocturnal hypoglycemia. So generally you don't want to do that. So I don't recommend Lantus uh, except for rare occasions. So that's a big X. Okay. So the other thing I don't particularly like in transplants are sliding scales. Now, most of you know what a sliding scale is. So a sliding scale, and I'm going to try to define it in a very particular way. Sliding scales are simply short-acting or prandial insulin that is used according to the pre-meal blood sugar and nothing else. No other considerations, right? I'm not talking about changing it for their diet. I'm not talking about changing it for their activity. I'm not talking about other ways of doing it. It's just looking at the blood sugar and then deciding how much insulin and giving that insulin. That's a sliding scale. Now, the reason I say no sliding scales is because, as you can imagine, with prednisone and with post-transplant diabetes, you've got a changing landscape of glucose over the entire day. So if you use one sliding scale for all the meals, you're going to have a different effect at every meal, depending on whether it's breakfast, lunch, or supper, because you have that different profile all throughout the day. So using one sliding scale is not really going to work for all the meals. And by the way, you're more likely to cause low blood sugars later in the day, because that's when the steroids are running out. So in the breakfast, it might work. At lunch, you're probably not giving enough because that's when the sugars are really high. And at supper, you might give too much and all of a sudden they're crashing, right? So that's why sliding scales are probably not the best way to go. Instead of sliding scales, we like to call it basal bolus insulin. So basal bolus insulin really is, as you can imagine, and by the way, this is a study that suggests that basal bolus insulin is actually a better way of managing post-transplant diabetes. This happened to be in, uh, versus sliding scale. Uh, this happened to be in, um, I think it was dexamethasone-induced hyperglycemia. So I'll give you an example of what I mean. So this is sliding scale, okay? Most of you see the sliding scale there. And they may be getting bolus insulin or, or basal insulin or not. I'm going to superimpose this profile, this glucose profile that I've already showed you, right? And they start out with blood sugars of 6 in the morning. Of course, people love to check their morning blood sugars. Why do they check their morning blood sugars? Because they're good. They're the best of the day. And they can pat themselves on the back, and they can say, Dr. Petty, my blood sugars are great. And I say, ah, when did you test? Uh, and so how many units did they use? Nothing, of course. Their blood sugars were good. Why would I use insulin if my blood sugars are good? What happens? They eat. Blood sugars go up. And of course, then they start giving their insulin. They give them insulin here, they use four units, but of course, by that time, the steroids are really, really working, right? And what happens? Their blood sugar rises even more. So what do they do now? They give more. And what happens? Well, it's starting to come down a little bit. It comes down to 10, that's at bedtime, but they're still worried about their sugars. So what do they do? Sliding scale, they give some more and crash. Because by that time, the prednisone is gone, or mostly gone, and they're not eating, and their sugars crash. 
So sliding scale is not a great, most very effective way. You're always chasing the blood sugar. You're never anticipating where, where it's going. You're just chasing it all the time. And you're not really doing it that effectively. By the time the insulin catches up, then crash, they go low. So what about basal bolus insulin? So this is a slightly different approach. So in this approach, what you're doing is trying to anticipate where the sugars are going rather than just reacting to what the sugars are doing, okay? So you can see there I've superimposed the, the sugar profile again, right? And we start out with a six, same as before. But in this case, instead of using sliding scale, what do you do? Well, we give NPH, okay? Now in this example, I gave NPH, but you can give prandial insulin too or instead of NPH, but in this case, I gave NPH. So you're giving NPH. Now, NPH doesn't really kick in right away. It's not a prandial insulin, but it does kick in sort of before lunchtime. So sometimes you can get away with NPH alone, covering that first meal of the day because the steroids haven't really kicked in. And so by the time lunch comes around, the sugar is decent. Depends on how much you give, obviously, All right? Now, sometimes you do require some prandial insulin, some mealtime insulin at breakfast, but generally speaking, so what do you do here? There's six. Now, if you were sliding scale, they wouldn't give anything, right? But of course, we do give something because we know that if the NPH is not enough, we know that their sugars are going to go high. So oftentimes, we'll give something at lunch just to control that afternoon glycemia. Now, in this case, I'm illustrating this just for an example. Now, if we gave the perfect dose of insulin at lunchtime, then their sugars should stay steady in the afternoon, right? But oftentimes we don't give the perfect dose, and what happens is their sugars do go up in the afternoon, despite our best efforts, right? Because we're always trying to figure out how much insulin they need at any one meal. Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we get it wrong. In this case, we got it wrong, and their sugars went up. Now, of course, we know that their sugars are high, so they will need some extra insulin just to bring that sugar down, but it's not pure sliding scale. What they do is we've already decided that they're gonna take four units at supper, so we're giving them a mealtime dose, a scheduled insulin dose, and then we're just adding a little bit on top of it to bring their sugar back down. Does that make sense? So it's not just sliding scale. What we're doing is we're giving them basal or background insulin, which is the NPH. We're giving them mealtime insulin, which is the regular or bolus insulin down here. That's scheduled doses. And then we're giving supplemental or what we call correction insulin as a means of bringing down an unexpectedly high blood sugar. So the correction insulin, I would distinguish between sliding scale, even though you look at this and you say, well, wait a second, isn't that a sliding scale? And I would say, okay, well, it looks like a sliding scale, but it's not a sliding scale. This is correction insulin. That's different from a sliding scale. What is a sliding scale? Sliding scale is purely blood sugar. Looking at blood sugar, giving the insulin, and that's it. This is not. This is on top of whatever scheduled basal and, and uh, mealtime insulin they have. And we call that correction insulin. So I know that that sounds like I'm just being semantic, but it isn't because there's a real philosophical and practical difference in how we do this versus how we do sliding scale insulin. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, everybody's happy. So uh, what about monitoring patients? Well, of course we do A1Cs every three months, generally speaking, unless they're really well controlled, in which case you can do it every six months. You wanna screen for microalbuminuria, obviously periodically, usually annually, but I'm sure it's done more often in the transplant setting. Uh, ophthalmology examinations, of course, every one to two years, as we do with anybody with diabetes, regular foot care, and testing the lipid profile. And of course, steroids have an effect on lipids, as I mentioned before. And then, of course, you want to treat dyslipidemia and hypertension in your post-transplant patients, generally speaking. I don't know what the philosophy is, but I would, would certainly recommend it. So uh, I'm going to conclude. I don't know how much time I've been. It's only been half an hour. But um, I'm going to conclude by saying uh, hyperglycemia is so common after transplant. We know that. There are lots of contributing factors, including modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors and the underlying pathology. We know that a postprandial pattern is usually the pattern that we see, and so you need to target that pattern. Oral agents can be useful, but usually only if the glucose is mildly elevated, not if it's severely elevated. And then, of course, chronic management requires regular monitoring follow-up. Um, and then there are a few unanswered questions. I'm not going to go through that, but there's lots of, that we still don't know about uh, post-transplant diabetes, uh, but hopefully we'll uh, eventually learn with time. So thank you very much. Thank you, Brad. That, that was perfect. That's exactly what we we're looking for. So uh, I'm sure there are some questions. Uh, why don't we try the try the uh, the remote sites first? I'll give you a chance, and then uh, we'll pipe in with some questions here. 
Um, Hello. Uh, hi. Th thank you for coming to talk to us. Um, this is Jocelyn. I just was hi. wondering what what does the pattern look like for calcineurin-induced diabetes? Is it a similar type experience or no? Uh, what medications would you use in that context? Yeah, so calcineurin inhibitors, as I mentioned before, their major effect is not peripheral insulin resistance. It's mostly beta cell. So it works on the beta cell to reduce insulin secretion. Of course, you will get some postprandial hyperglycemia, but it's not that sort of diurnal variation that you get with steroids. So generally speaking, you can use oral agents, but remember, if you're using a sulfonylurea, for instance, all you're, what you're doing is you're trying to flog the pancreas. You're basically stimulating the pancreas to produce more insulin. And of course, that might work. But in someone who's got borderline insulin secretion, it may not be a good long-term strategy. I, I generally would try oral agents, depending on the degree of hyperglycemia. If they're not using steroids and they're just using a calcineurin inhibitor, I would try oral agents first and use the standard oral agents, assuming that their kidney function is normal or reasonably normal. You could try metformin first. You could add a sulfonylurea, but I generally try to stay away from glyburide because glyburide, I think, is a little bit... It's got a lot of side effects, weight gain and hypoglycemia. So I would try to use something like diamicron or glycoside. And then you can use a DPP-4 inhibitor. I often use the combination of metformin plus a DPP-4. So that would be, I don't know if you've, you've used these before, but it's like um, Genta Duetto and uh, what's the other one? Combo Glyze and Janumet. All of them uh, potentially could be used uh, pretty effectively in people with mild hypoglycemia. So that's generally what I would, what I would do. Other than insulin. How about uh, Invocana and Victoza? Right. So Invocana is an SGLT2 inhibitor and Victoza is a uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist. So those have not really been studied in the transplant setting and I would be very careful about using a, um, an SGLT2 inhibitor. Uh, of course, the mechanism of Invocana and drugs like it, that's Invocana and Giardians and uh, Forziga, are that they're very rid, uh, uh, renal or kidney uh, um, uh, specific. I mean, they, they work through the renal tubules. And, and frankly, I don't know that there's enough information uh, or studies suggesting safety and efficacy in this setting that I would be comfortable using them. So I do not use the SGLT2 inhibitors. Maybe in the future there'll be enough uh, data that we can say whether this is safe or not, but I do just uh, feel at this point we don't have enough information to safely use the SGLT2 inhibitors. The GLP-1 receptor agonists um, I think are reasonable. I don't, I, I mean, the, the evidence so far suggests that they're probably pretty safe for the kidney. Um, and in fact, we have used them in other transplant settings, not kidney transplant, but uh, certainly with the islet transplant patients, we've used them. We've had no problem whatsoever. Um, and so I anticipate that, um, that the GLP-1 receptor agonists, like Victoza or, or other ones like it, probably will be safe to use. Although, again, we don't have a lot of data. Uh, so I would be just cautious, I think, in using those. Um, yeah. yeah. What about insulin pump? Uh, do you, how do you adjust the basal rate uh, to combat those steroid uh, um, surge, whatever you call it? So you're, you're talking about someone who's already on the pump prior to transplant and they get a transplant, is right. that correct? Right, Yeah, I mean, generally I wouldn't, I wouldn't start somebody new, brand new on the pump after transplant. That's, I mean, with some rare exceptions, I suppose. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it comes down to looking at their basal requirements. So remember, most of the effect of the steroids is going to be postprandial hyperglycemia. So for the most part, you're probably dealing with changes in their bolus insulin requirements. And if they're doing carb counting, then you're probably going to be looking at different carb ratios for different meals. So they're going to be, have to set their carb ratio different at breakfast, then lunch, and then at supper. Because if they have the same carb ratio throughout the whole day, they're either going to be underdosing at certain times, like maybe supper, or they're, uh, sorry, underdosing at lunch, where their requirements are the greatest, and overdosing perhaps excuse me, at supper or breakfast when their requirements are less. So you, you need to individualize those kinds of uh, cases. And, and there may be some mild changes in basal insulin, uh, but this has become, a, that's a little more sophisticated and I generally don't recommend, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, of people take on pump therapy or uh, changing their pump settings unless they have a pretty good understanding. They had uh, either diabetes educators or, or people who really understand the pump. So, um, just be careful about that. Did you have a question? Um, thanks very much, Britt. That was a really good talk. Um, it's kind of a follow-on question from um, the previous question. And 
it's in patients like type 1 diabetics who got a living donor transplant and are now waiting for their pancreas transplant. So it's unlikely that those patients will be on steroids because they got a living donor transplant. But the, how different does their diabetes act after their kidney transplant? They will have the CNI influence, but will, and their control has to be pretty good, that kidney function grow. But could you comment a little bit on how we can really control their yeah, so, so uh, type 1, uh, I, I was speaking for the most part about type 2 diabetes, that's the vast majority of people we see, but type 1 is a particular challenge. And, and you remember, type the, the underlying pathophysiology of type 1 diabetes is insulin deficiency. It's not really insulin resistance. Now, you're going to have some people with type 1 who have insulin resistance, and it's simply because the, the, uh, the genetics, if you want to call it that, of insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes is fairly common uh, in the general population. So no, no doubt you're going to have some people who have some degree of insulin resistance. But by and large, you're talking about insulin deficiency as the underlying pathology in type 1 diabetes. So that means that you're not going to be dealing with the same degree of insulin resistance. They're not uh, usually not overweight. They're not on steroids. So again, you're dealing with mostly beta cell deficiency. And for calcineurin inhibitors, in type 1 diabetes, there's no effect. They don't have beta cells, essentially, so there's no effect on beta cells. So I would say uh, dealing with type 1s really comes down to the function of the kidney and what the kidney does to their insulin. And that ends up being either the stress of the surgery, um, you know, with, with the, and that can induce some counter-regulation, that is some uh, glucagon and other hormones kicking in, and some degree of insulin resistance, just temporary. Um, and, but other than that, it's, it's mostly, oh, and, and also the renal clearance of insulin that we mentioned. So their insulin requirements may go up uh, modestly, I, I think, after transplant. But, it, you know, that's a small uh, a, a factor. I, th I think the biggest factor is all, with always with type 1 diabetes is how do they match their, in, their mealtime insulin requirements to the, what they're eating and what they're doing. And that is, really is the, is, is the hardest thing for type 1 diabetes to do. And, and, and no doubt the people who have kidney transplants are usually the most, what we think of as brittle diabetes, because they're the people, unfortunately, who have probably had the worst glycemic control prior to their transplant and also are at higher risk for, uh, for end-stage renal failure. So it is a, it is a really difficult situation. Um, and, and I would encourage anyone in that situation to get someone who has a lot of experience in dealing with type 1 and the pump uh, to deal with those people, because there's no easy, no easy answers, unfortunately. This is, uh, this is a slightly off topic in a way, but have you ever used an agent like Victoza for post-transplant weight gain? And if you have, did it work? Um, right. So I assume you mean to lose weight, not to gain weight. Um, yes. Yes. Right. Um, so, so, but keep in mind, uh, Victoza is not approved for weight loss, um, but there is a, uh, the same molecule essentially is approved with, uh, under the label Saxenda. So you've got the same molecule, the same drug that has two different names. One is Victoza, approved for type, type 2 diabetes, and one is Saxenda, approved for weight loss in, in non-diabetic patients. Um, so the answer is yes, you can use it. Uh, I don't know if I've used it specifically for weight loss, but I've certainly used it for diabetes in the setting of obesity, and it tends to be effective. Uh, like I said, you know, the, the, the peptide, the GLP-1 peptide is, is, is broken down uh, irrespective of the kidney, and, and it really has no deleterious effect on kidney function as far as I can see, uh, and I don't think there's any real, I mean, just uh, without having really randomized controlled trials or anything, there's no real reason why it can't be used in this setting. So, uh, but again, I just would, would be cautious since we don't have definitive data about that. But, but my answer would be yes, it can be used. Okay, thank you.